Hey, I'm Francesco. This is a really exciting video. I finally get to show off the finished 4x5 stereographic camera. Um, I've been working on this for a little while now. The camera's finally finished. I've been testing it. It works incredibly well, better than I thought it was going to. I'm super excited about it. Um, but so I wanted to take some time to make a video to talk about the camera, recap the whole build, talk about how everything came together, how it works, how I'm going to use it in the field, various different media that I can shoot inside the camera, talk about a lot of its specific specifications and how those relate to how it will actually be used. Before we continue, there is a lot of information in this video, and I try to make these videos so that there's a little something for everyone. Whether you have no idea what stereo photography is and you just think it's a really cool looking camera, all the way through individuals who are very seasoned in stereo photography and who may be here for the technical aspects of the camera. So I've created a clickable table of contents in the video description below that will let you go through and find exactly what parts of the video you'd like to jump to if you're interested in that. So we're going to take a walk around the camera and take a closer look at it. And then we're going to take it out and do some test shots around my property with it. So we'll take a look at those test shots and then I'll also show you how I actually view the stereo pairs out of this. So this is a 4x5 stereographic camera, so it makes 4x5 images, which is significantly larger than traditional stereo pairs. So if you're familiar with stereo photography, and I'm talking about traditional stereo photography, so the, the type that was practiced in the late 19th century, early 20th century. If you're familiar with that, then you've probably seen stereo cards, and you probably have an idea around what the size of the images are. Those cards fit into a special type of viewer that you're able to hold up in front of your face and view through a set of lenses that will merge the two images together to create the stereo effect. You may also be familiar with stereo photography um, from being a kid and playing with the Master View little stereo toy thing. It was usually like a little red thing that you would hold up to your eye with these little circular discs with little slides around the circumference of the disc. And you would click a little arm and the slide would rotate and you would hold it up to the light, and some of them had a light built in, and that would create a 3D image as well. Those all work on the same principles, the, the master view being much smaller than traditional uh, 19th century, early 20th century stereo views. So because the images that this camera produces are much larger than either of those, a special type of stereo viewer needs to be used, uh, which is called a mirror stereoscope. And those were traditionally used by the military more than anything for looking at 3D aerial reconnaissance photographs. And so the stereo viewers that I have, I have two of them right now, but I'll show you both of those when, when we're done processing um, the test images and we're in the dark room actually looking at the results. So the camera, let's talk about the camera. Let's talk about how it all came together. So this camera was built using a whole bunch of donor parts um, that I had accumulated over a few years, and I wasn't actually sure what all of those parts were gonna go to. I knew I wanted to build a stereo camera at some point in time, um, but I didn't know I was going to be building a 4x5 stereo camera. I wasn't sure how I was going to find the parts or even design it so that it would work at that format. But everything kind of just came together in a pretty amazing way. And I ended up with everything that I needed, uh, save for a few odds and ends that I had to search for. So in terms of the body, there was a considerable amount of woodworking done. I had to strip everything down, disassemble it all the way. So I did a total refinishing of all the wood. I also veneered it using red oak. Um, I extended the body a little bit on both sides using solid red oak as well. And that was so that I could accommodate, let me actually turn it around. So when looking at the back of the camera, what we actually see are two older Graflex style backs. So these are the types of backs that are most commonly found on RB Series B or Auto Graflex 4x5 cameras. Um, they originally would have had a, a ridge up at the top that would seat into a groove on the film holders that were designed for these backs. So I used the older Graflex backs and now I have modified these and I've modified these so that they actually take modern standard film holders. I've removed the ridge on the top of them and I've added shims to the sides to accommodate the slightly more narrow dimensions of modern film holders. I also stripped these down. I applied new felt for the light seals um, and, and overall clean them up. Now I needed to extend the 
dimensions of the body a little bit in order to accommodate both of these backs and get them basically butted up against each other. And while we're at the back of the camera, I should mention how the camera is actually focused. So notice that these are open backs. There's not graph lock backs, there's no spring backs, so there's no ground glass. So what I'm actually using is this slightly modified Graphlex ground glass attachment. And it's a really cool little thing with a nice little pop-up hood and the ground glass is right there. So this was originally designed for these backs to be used bef before I've modified them. So I had to modify this just slightly by bringing down the dimensions on two of the sides just slightly so, this is, so that it's the same dimension as modern film holders that now fit the backs after the modifications. And the way that this works is this just seats right into place just like that very easily. So once that's in place, I flick that little button, the hood opens up, and you're able to view the ground glass and focus it like any other camera. So once I make sure everything is sharp and it's composed the way that I want, I can close that, pull that off the camera, put the film holder on that side. This side would have already had the film holder on it and ready to go, so I just need to attach the one film holder and I'm ready to shoot. So like I said, I extended the body using red oak. Um, and then once all the woodworking and cleanup was done, I veneered over all of the, I veneered over the top with red oak veneer to match the red oak sides. I left the bottom alone, which I believe was probably made out of a birch ply or something like that. Um, I left that alone because it's constantly rubbing on stuff anyway. So overall, the camera is red oak uh, with a walnut stain. Um, to give it a, a particularly beautiful brown tonality. And the grain and characteristic of the wood really stands out at that tone, so I like it a lot. Spinning it back around, I also disassembled all of the metal hardware. I refinished all of the metal used for the front standard, and then I painted that a flat black. I also refinished all of the additional metal hardware. Everything was very dirty and gummed up and corroded, so all of that was refinished as well just to give things a cleaner look. While it was all apart, I did a complete CLA on all of the mechanical parts of the camera, um, which there isn't really a lot. There's a drive shaft, which is actually slightly visible on the inside of the camera here. That drive shaft connects at the bottom of the track with a set of gears that mesh with a set of teeth on the track itself. The drive shaft travels up through the body. There's another set of gears that mesh with the track on the top. It, the drive shaft then comes through the top of the body where the knob is, and that's where the focus control is. And so when this knob on top is turned, the camera focuses. And the bellows were in good shape. Um, I put one small patch on one part of the bellows, but the bellows were otherwise totally light, tight, supple, and uh, really no need to replace them. So the bellows are good. So if you're interested in a little bit more information on the steps that I just described in building the camera, um, I will put up a little thing, whatever it's called, that pops up at the top edge of the video um, with a link to the playlist for the videos that I've made on this particular camera build. And you can watch through the previous videos and get a good sense of all of the work that went into the actual woodworking, construction, and the build itself. Now, to talk a bit about the actual function of the camera, how its construction influences how it actually works and everything like that. So the camera has a minimum focus of 150 millimeters, which happened to match perfectly with the lenses that I found and wanted to design the camera around. I'll talk about the lenses in a bit. But so we have a minimum 150 millimeter focus and the camera has a focus travel of 88 millimeters. So it goes from 150 millimeters to 238 millimeters, which is pretty ideal for the 150 millimeter lenses that I'm using with the camera. So this, frame, which was a part of the donor camera, was designed originally to take uh, Graphlex crown graphic or pacemaker lens boards. Now, these are the, if I can take it off, these are the type of lens boards that have these rounded edges and light traps kind of built into them so that they seat very nicely and minimize any light leaks that might get past the edges. Now let's talk about the lenses. These are really cool lenses and I was very excited to find them. They are a matching serial number pair, meaning that when these lenses were manufactured a very long time ago, they were designed specifically to be used with a stereo camera. And both lenses are stamped with the same serial number because they were sold as a set and intended to always be used together. So that's really cool. So these lenses are Gore's 150 millimeter 
F6.8 Doppel and Astigmats, Series 3, Number 1. Long name. They made a lot of different designations for different types of stereo lenses in, in those days. These lenses are circa 1887, which I was born in 1987. So these lenses were made 100 years before I was born. I just think that's really cool. So the interesting thing about these lenses is they actually predate the standard f-stop system. So these lenses are marked in the Gores scale. And even though they're f6.8 lenses, the maximum aperture is actually marked as f4.6. And they have a minimum f-stop of f384. Now, if you ever end up getting a hold of an old lens like this, you might look at that and say, oh, wow, how can it possibly go to f384? Well, it, it doesn't. That doesn't equate to a modern, actual, conventional f384. That's just a different scale that was used. So when I use these lenses, I do need to consult a conversion table so that I pick the correct f-stop related to the true f-stop that I'm reading with my meter and everything like that. But it's very simple. It doesn't really create any kind of problem. Now, one thing to note in how I use the lenses, or at least how I'm using them today for the particular test that we're going to run. And when testing the camera, as well as what I just enjoy shooting a lot of in the first place, is we're going to, use, we're going to be doing direct positives. And I do direct positives in typically one of two ways. I either shoot paper negatives in the camera and then I reversal process them into positives, or I just use a direct positive paper. And my favorite of those is the Harman direct positive paper. So that's what I'm going to shoot in it today. And that Harman direct positive paper is inherently high contrast. So generally when I'm shooting it, I like to control that contrast by shooting through a filter. And I use a number two variable contrast filter with that you would typically use in an enlarger. And the way that I have that set up is if I take one of these off, it's actually just cut down to size and attached to the rear of the lens. So it's a behind the lens filter. And that colored contrast filter is going to help control the inherently high contrast of the direct positive paper and give a more pleasing image. Now, if I were shooting this with dry plates or daguerreotype plates, I would take those filters off because they would probably have an un unintended effect. But for the purpose of shooting direct positive paper with this, I'm leaving those filters on. And now the last thing that I want to talk about before we get into the actual testing is super important for stereo photography, and that's lens spacing. So generally, with a standard stereographic camera, the lens spacing is optimally set at about two and a half inches. Some people will push that to up to three and a half inches, but it's intended to basically match the interocular distance between human eyes because a stereo camera sees the same way that we see. It's exactly the same optical functionality. So when you have the lenses set at that distance, the lenses essentially become your eyes. The left lens is your left eye, the right lens is your right eye. So generally for stereo cameras, they're set up with the lens spacing matching the interocular distance between human eyes. Now, when I originally tested the camera, I was a little bit worried because when you scale the camera up in size to four by five, you get to a certain point where it becomes almost physically impossible to set the lenses close enough to each other to match that distance. Now that ended up all working out perfectly because of the design of the camera, but that was a concern. So my lenses set at a neutral point, meaning the lenses are set basically centered with an equal amount of travel in either direction. So I can bring them closer together the same amount that I can bring them further apart. So I, I call that my neutral point with the lenses. And at that neutral point, these lenses are 15.25 centimeters apart which is roughly twice the interocular distance, depending on what, no, what number you're honing in on. I prefer a little bit more of a stereo effect in the images. So with a conventional stereo camera, I would be leaning towards about three and a half inches distance rather than two and a half. Um, so I'm using that as my benchmark, the three and a half. So 15.25 centimeters is roughly twice that. Now, the way that this all worked out, which is very interesting, I initially did my test by bringing the lenses as close as I possibly could, trying to get them as close to the interocular distance as possible, knowing that they would still be further apart. But I wasn't super worried about that because that extra distance will create what's referred to as a hyper stereo effect. It increases the stereo effect a little bit more than it otherwise would be. So you end up with greater separation between objects in your foreground, middle ground, and background. So I did the original tests. And what I ended up finding, and I'll throw an image up, I ended up finding that the lens that I focused through was centered, but the other lens had created an image that was pretty drastically offset. 
And that meant that when the pair was viewed through the stereoscope, I was losing a considerable amount of image area. And I didn't want that. That's not ideal. That's not optimal. So I went back to the drawing board and I started remeasuring everything. And what I actually realized is there's a big difference between this camera and most of the stereo cameras that you would find out there. Most other stereo cameras were actually designed to shoot on one piece of film. So you'd have a larger piece of film in one film holder in the back of the camera, and you'd have a septum inside the center of the camera that's separating the two image areas. And the lenses spaced much closer together in a smaller format would make two images on a single piece of film. Those images would generally be butted up against each other edge to edge or very close to it. That was the key. So when we turn the camera around, with my design, because I used two focal planes, because I wanted to be able to, to use two separate film holders, now the key here is the actual nearest edges of both film planes are offset. That became the key. When I measured that, I realized that they are offset by six centimeters. So the actual working distance between the lenses is the distance measured subtracted by the offset between the two edges of the film plane. So if we take 15.25 centimeters distance between the lenses minus six centimeters offset, that gives us 9.25 centimeters, which is right in the sweet spot that I was aiming for. 9.25 centimeters is about three and a half inches, which is exactly where I wanted in relation to the interocular distance with a little bit more to give me a little bit more stereo effect in the images. Now, with that said, so I call that the, the working distance between the lenses. So even though they're measured at 15.25 centimeters, with the offset taken into account, they're recording on the film as if the film were butted up against each other edge to edge, as I described before. And they're creating images at a working distance of 9.25 centimeters. But the actual true distance between the lenses still matters. And that extra distance helps to add that hyperfocal effect that I wanted, which is particularly useful in the larger size images that come out of this 4x5 stereographic camera. Because the images are so much larger, that hyper, hyper stereo effect creates a really profound, really beautiful, pronounced three-dimensional image with excellent spacing between between foreground, midground, and background. And that just really stands out in the larger size image where it's not really needed in the smaller, more traditional formats. So that's just kind of a series of happy accidents that just kind of work together really perfectly in the design of the camera. But I wanted to explain that because anyone who's familiar with stereo photography is gonna see this and they're gonna notice that the lenses are much further apart than, than you would otherwise think that they should be. But in actual practice, the way the, and with the way that the camera is designed, it works out perfectly. And it gives us uh, a, a lens spacing very close to a relative interocular distance, but still producing the hyper stereo effect that we want in the larger format. And just one final note is around the construction of the camera in relation to the lens spacing. This little wheel right, right here turns. And when that wheel turns, it is actually a distance control and it will bring those lenses closer together or further apart. And that's a little ad adaptation that you won't find on a lot of traditional stereo cameras, except for the professional models, the high-end models would have had this. So I was happy to have this because it makes it easy to change that spacing if I want to. I can bring them a little bit closer if I need to. I can bring them a little bit further apart if I need to. And that's all relative to the scene that you're photographing. And there's a lot of math when you get into precision stereo photography, which I'm not concerned about from a fine art perspective, but if you were, you do need to be able to control that spacing and there's math that defines how far you want the lens spacing to be for a particular subject distance. Um, but I just wanted to mention that it's got that cool little wheel there that controls the spacing. And then one final note about the lenses themselves. So being much older lenses in the first place, these lenses don't have shutters. That's not an issue for me because most of the processes that I work with tend to be slow processes. So I'm not shooting conventional film in this. I'm not putting 400 ISO Tri-X in here or anything like that. So I don't need shutters. So when I make my exposures, I'm able to just use the lens caps really easily and just take them off, make the exposure and put them right back on. And so far that's worked nearly perfectly. I am gonna look into 
a couple of other options. There's some interesting antiquarian flap shutters that are really cool, which is just a little assembly here that's got little, almost like eyelids. They're kind of like bat wing eyelids that flip down. You can turn a little knob and they open up at the same time and they close at the same time. So I might look at installing something like that on it, but I don't really need it right now. And the processes that I work with are all slow processes. So I'm always working with exposure times of it at, at minimum one second, but usually even longer than that. So the lens cap situation works perfectly fine. If I did want to use film with it later on, I could just get a different set of lenses and shutters and mount those on the lens boards and use it as well. But for my purposes, this is pretty perfect and ideal. Okay, so we're going to do a test shot. Um, I have my wonderful model over here, my wife, Laura. And <clears throat> it's getting to a good time of day. We live in San Diego, so it's usually very sunny and very contrasty. There's still a little bit of sunlight peeking through, um, but hopefully that'll be fine. Otherwise, the lower sun's going to help with contrast a little bit on top of the internal filters um, that are back behind the lenses, uh, which are gonna help to control the contrast of the Harman Direct Positive paper as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set up the shot, focus it on her, and then we're gonna make that exposure. So I'm gonna shoot this uh, paper today at ISO 6. So I'm gonna shoot at F16, and I'm gonna remove the ground glass. That was a nice save. And so for an F16 exposure at ISO 6, we're going to do 8 seconds. 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 7 1,000, 8 1,000. Now we came out early in the morning to kind of redo this shot to see if we can get a better exposure so it's a little sunnier. Um, but I've gone ahead and I've moved the camera closer. Um, because I really want to test how close of a portrait I can get with this camera. There's some weird stuff that can happen with the distance between the lenses at a certain point um, in terms of getting close to your subject. So this is a really good test just to see uh, how, how close of a, a portrait I can actually get. Ready? 1, 1,000, 5, 1, So we're looking out over the valley now, and um, I want to see how a landscape style shot is gonna work where most of what's in the scene is pretty much background. This is the type of scene where you're basically looking at a vista and there's not much happening in the foreground, really not much happening in the middle ground, and most of what's around you is it's kind of far away. So in the scene that we have here, there are some middle ground objects like the tall palm tree that you can probably see a little bit of from this angle. Um, down in our yard, which goes down uh, probably 70 or 80 feet that way down the mountain, um, we have some raised garden bed planters. So those planters in the palm tree are kind of our middle ground objects, as well as some bushes and shrubs and agave that are down there as well. And then everything else behind it starts to get into the background. And there's different levels of background going down into the valley. And then, of course, at the end, the, uh, the mountains in the background. So I'm interested to see how the 3D effect works when you don't really have any foreground objects and everything is kind of further away. So this will be an interesting shot and should give me some really good information. Okay, so we're going to go ahead now and start developing. It's a little dark. Very nice. Okay, so some of these are a little darker than I want. I've actually mixed up some farmer's reducer, which is potassium ferrocyanide and sodium thiosulfate. Um, and this is going to help bleach out some of the prints to bring up the highlights and a little bit of the midtones and hopefully balance the prints a bit more. So hopefully this works. So before we look at the results of the tests, I'm going to show you what the mirror stereoscopes are. So this is exactly what would have been used by the military when viewing aerial reconnaissance photographs made in stereo as well. And this larger mirror stereoscope can actually view images up to 9 by 9 inches, which is huge. Um, so it's more than enough uh, for a 4 by 5.
Here's a smaller one, um, exactly the same thing, but in a smaller size. Um, and so this can also do four by five. Um, the images are just placed closer together under this one, and there's a little less breathing room around the perimeter of the image than there is with the larger one. The stereoscopes work, if I flip it upside down, so these are collapsible essentially. So these little legs fold up um, and you see that there are mirrors underneath. And so there are the mirrors there. There's also a set of lenses that flip down or flip up depending on what you wanna do. And those are the lenses that give you different magnifications for what you're looking at. The small one works in basically the same way. If I flip it upside down, you see the mirrors. Now there's actually two set of mirrors on this one. There's the larger mirror and there's a smaller mirror under these two things because there's no flip down lenses on this one. So the image is being reflected into this mirror, bouncing off of this mirror, and then it's viewed through the lenses right here. So they're very similar in their construction and their operation, um, and they do basically the same thing. So the stereoscope goes there, and I'm gonna place the images down underneath. So one image will go down, and then the next image will go down, and while I'm viewing through it, I'm gonna be moving one image until the two become perfectly coincident. And that's what's gonna produce the stereoscopic or 3D effect. Now, I'm really excited to see what these look like because I'm physically here. The bummer is that it's kind of impossible for me to actually show you what these actually look like in real life because you have to physically be here. You have to have two eyes. You have to be looking through the stereoscope because it's viewing it with both of your eyes that produces that stereo effect. So the closest that I can come to showing you is going to be making what are called wiggle gifts. So I'm going to take the images and I'm going to photograph them. I'm going to put them into Photoshop and I'm going to merge the two together in essentially an animated GIF that will flip the images back and forth really fast. And it kind of gives a little bit of the illusion of the three dimensionality. It's nothing like actually seeing them in person. Um, and I've already tested this with images this size, and it's a different situation than when you do the same thing with smaller stereo pairs. So because traditional stereo cameras are much smaller and the lenses are inherently closer together because of that size, there's less offset. All of that scales up the larger and larger you go. So that produces a little bit of a problem in creating a wiggle GIF to give you a really good sense of what these actually look like. And what you'll see in the wiggle GIFs is they're basically centered on one part of the image, and then you'll see progressively more movement the further back you go in the image. Um, in, in wiggle GIFs that are made with traditional 19th century stereo pairs or just smaller stereo pairs in general, because there's so little shift difference in those smaller formats, there's very little of that exaggeration of movement in the background, and it produces a better stereo effect when viewing on a computer screen. That effect isn't quite as good when you scale up in size to the 4x5 size, because there's just a greater difference between the two images of the pair. And that's just a product of the process. It is exactly what produces such an extraordinary stereo effect in the 4x5 images when viewed in person, but when it comes to sharing them online or viewing them on a computer screen, it produces a little bit of a challenge. So I'm gonna do my best to produce some decent wiggle gifts for you and I'll throw them up as I'm looking at it so you can kind of get a sense, but just understand that the wiggle gifts are not doing this justice. They'll give you a little bit of a sense, um, but the three dimensionality that I'm seeing is so much better, so much more lifelike than what you're actually gonna be seeing. And I'm actually not seeing anything moving back and forth or anything like that. I'm looking at the image as if I was standing there in the scene and actually looking at, at what I photographed in the first place. So those are just some caveats to set expectations with the wiggle gifts that I'm gonna show. They're useful and it'll help in explaining what I'm trying to explain. But if you really wanna understand how incredible these are, you have to view them in person. All right, so now I'm gonna start taking pairs over here to the uh, mirror stereoscope. We're gonna see what they look like. Very excited to see these. So here's the first one, which turned out quite lovely. And so we're gonna go ahead and put this pair down to see what it looks like. That is incredible. You gotta make sure you get it really aligned perfectly um, with objects all throughout the image, foreground, middle ground, and background, and then when it just sinks into place, it's insane. Okay, let's check out the next one. So this is the next one that we're looking at, which is higher contrast than I would have otherwise liked, again, 
uh, but it's still a very good image, and these two are going to blend quite well. Now this shot was a, uh, a close-up because I wanted to test how close I could actually get with the camera before there were issues with offset between the two images. And I wanted to make sure that there wouldn't be any eye fatigue when viewing an image like this. This is incredible. This is a closer shot than I had ever expected to be able to make with the camera um, just due to the positions of the lenses. Uh, but this is spectacular. The separation here is insane. This is this is absolute confirmation that I'll be doing a lot of portraiture with this camera, particularly environmental portrait. So here's the next image that we're working with. Oh, wow. So even looking at this, so this is a landscape and almost everything that I shot was basically at infinity. The closest thing is probably the raised garden beds down at the bottom. And those were probably at least 50 feet away from where I was. And this syncs up incredibly well. That giant palm tree stands out beautifully. And the raised garden beds are, are, are quite a far away in front of it. And they stand out in the foreground beautifully. The shrubs at the bottom have gorgeous separation from everything falling off down to the trees on the bottom. And there's even separation, honestly, when you get into the background, the trees that are down on the ground level of the valley still have separation between them and the, the rest of the valley out as it fades up into the sky. So this camera is going to be exceptional for everything from portraits to landscape views. This camera turned out so much better than I thought it was going to. This is so validating. This is the kind of thing where you work on a project for as long as I worked on this one. And the whole time you're just wondering whether or not it's going to work or how well it's going to work or what you're actually going to be able to do with it. And then when everything comes together and things just snap, they just work. It is the most incredible feeling in the world. So I'm incredibly excited. So that's the camera. And I hope you've enjoyed the video and found it informative. I'm super stoked about it. I'm considering this an absolute total success. Um, and I'm beyond stoked to take the camera out and get into actually using it for various projects in the field. I will be making more videos about the camera, especially as I get into using it for various projects. And I also have some experiments that I'm really looking forward to with using different media in the camera. I have plans to use it for some dry plate photography. And what excites me more than anything is at some point, I'm going to try making stereographic daguerreotypes using the camera. So that's just a little bit to look out for in the future. So if you're curious about anything or you have any questions about the camera, feel free to drop them in the comments below. If you're working on your own stereographic camera, you can always feel free to email me through the website. I'm always down to help people with their projects. And uh, yeah, that's it. So again, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and definitely check out our page on Facebook as well as the website, which are both linked in the video description below. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.